everybody, James with Love My Pups. Today, well, uh, Love My Pups, my breeder supply. I've done some previous videos on animal genetics. They've been received pretty well. People say, give me more of that. So I'm gonna give you more of that in a slightly different bent. And today I wanna to talk about um, genetic diversity um, and some of the misconceptions that I run across literally on a daily basis about some of the, well, I'll give you an example. I did a video the other day and I had a, I've got a new fluffy boy. Uh, that's a new, new thing for us fluffies. And I got a lot of people who um, put in their comments, uh, you know, that this is a terrible thing and you shouldn't be doing it. And it's not a purebred Frenchie. So I want to talk a little bit about what, what this all really means. So it's a fairly complicated topic. So I, I want to start with some basics. So let's start with how you make offspring in the first place. So let's go back to talking about DNA. So everybody has, all creatures, even bugs, grass, trees, human beings, Frenchies, dogs, have strands of DNA. And I'm gonna show you two strands of DNA, and I'm not gonna do a very good job drawing this, and I apologize for that, that come from parents. One's a mom, one's a dad. So this is a strand, it's, it's all, when I show it this way, it's actually a helix, it's all interwoven together. And you have, I don't know what it is, 23 chromosomes, it might be 21, I forget. But anyway, you have 23 of these silly things that make you up. And each one of these has got genetic material on it. You have about 20 to 25,000 genes that make you up. And I have 25,000 genes or thereabouts that make me up. And so does a Frenchie. And we are all unique. I mean, to the point that there's no two, unless you are um, um, identical twins, there is no, uh, there, your genetic makeup is different than everybody else's. And that's why if you commit a crime, by the way, you can get caught doing it just from your fingerprint or some saliva that you left, because your genetic material you leave behind pinpoints you. Right, so what's going on here? So basically, these genes are, <clears throat> are two proteins, or two bases, um, and A, G, T, uh, well, let's not go into the details of exactly what they are, but enough said that basically you have pairs of these genes that are uh, part of you. Of you. <clears throat> um, and we'll just kind of draw a couple of them out here. Uh, we're gonna draw a couple out like this, right. So what happens was when these two animals get together, bullfrogs, French bulldogs, Labrador retrievers, human beings, this thing splits in two, and it then combines with the split one from the other parent, and that makes up the new organism, the new creature, and so it gets a combination of genes from both parents. So if you think about this, it's like having a deck of 25,000 cards, and you get the two parents together, and they get thrown on the floor, and they then pick up a new deck, is it gonna be the same as either the decks of the two parents? It's not even remotely close. But there are some things that are, you know, things like eye color, hair length, maybe intelligence, size of your nose. You know, these are all come from, inherited from the genetics that you get from both your parents. All well and good. The problem comes when you pick up a bad gene. So let's just make this here. <clears throat> we'll put it in a different color. But we're gonna signify that. And I just did that with a magic marker that won't come off, so that's stupid. Let me just get that off right now before it ruins my board. Oh, I'm too late. Look at that, I'm an idiot. Oh, well, we'll have to live with that through the rest of the video. All right, so basically, let's just put a gene in here that is the, the deadly gene, the gene we don't want. For example of this would be people who get Huntington's disease. They have to get this really terrible gene from both parents for it to be expressed. And if they get it, in 10 years, when they're about 20 or 30 years old, they show the symptoms of Huntington's disease, and about 10 years later, they're dead, and it's fatal. Terrible, terrible thing. Sickle cell anemia is another thing that affects uh, African Americans, where if they get this from both parents, that they have then uh, blood cells that are sickle shaped, and they get blocked up in arteries, and then they have huge problems. So those are both examples of the really bad gene. Right, so the problem gets to be is if you have Two cop, if you, if you get together with a parent, mother and father, who both have this really bad gene, you are guaranteed to get it. And with that, you can have the consequences of this really bad gene. So there are other genes 
Blue would be an example in French Bulldogs, where most of these things are what are called recessive genes. You have to have a copy of it from both parents. So let's just talk about blue for a second. Let's talk about chocolate because it's labeled B. It's a little bit easier to look at. So a, a parent can either be BB, doesn't have chocolate. It can be BB, has a carrier of chocolate but doesn't show it. Or it is BB, it is a chocolate dog and has two copies of it. That is a chocolate dog. Just like with the Huntington disease, you, know, you can be HH, don't have it. You can be HH, you're a carrier of it. Or you can be HH, small H's, and you've got it and you've got problems. All right. So, Punnett square lets us decide how these things go together. So we're going to do a quick Punnett square over here, just to kind of remind ourselves about how this works. So here is our Punnett square. And we're going to put one of the parents up on top. We'll make that parent be a chocolate carrier. And we'll make the other parent be a chocolate carrier as well. And the Punnett square, we add these things together to see what we get. It's a non-chocolate dog. And here we've got a chocolate carrier dog. And here we've got a chocolate carrier dog. And here we have... The chocolate dog. Right. So whether you get to be a chocolate dog or not is determined by a single gene, a single gene out of 25 or 20 or 25,000 genes that's present. So to think that the presence of a chocolate gene is going to cause all kinds of problems for a French bulldog or any other dog isn't quite ridiculous. It is completely ridiculous. It just doesn't work that way. What we, are, what we are concerned about is what is called genetic diversity, and we're going to get onto that in a moment. That is a whole different deal. The size of your gene pool is your, is your, is your genetic diversity, or, or your, um, um, what's the, there's other words we use for, I can't even think about how we call it now, but uh, your um, biological diversity. Those things are so much more important. So I get this thing about, well, okay, so it's a fluffy gene. Well, what was, where did that come from? Well, I'm going to give you a story here. So I've got a friend down in Texas. Her name's Annette. I'm going to give her a last name because she may not want it. She's a great person. She knows a lot about dogs. She's been a wealth of information to me over the years. She produced a long-haired dog 10 years ago, Frenchie. And she gave that dog away pet only because she thought that it was something that should, you know, wasn't correct. And at the time, it was not correct. But if she did not known what she really had then, she had the beginnings of a new line of French Bulldogs. She didn't breed it with a Chihuahua. She didn't breed it with some other dog to get a long-haired dog. It just got a long-haired dog picked up. And if she'd taken that long-haired dog and bred that to another long-haired dog, she'd have started a line of long-haired Frenchies. And they'd still be Frenchies. They'd have, if you did a genetic test on to say, is this a French Bulldog? They would absolutely have been French Bulldogs. The only difference is, is that in the 20,000 genes that were present, it had one gene that was to do with the long hair. Obviously, this is not significant unless it's a disastrous gene like the sickle cell gene or the Huntington disease gene or a handful of other genes that are absolute terrible things to have. But whether you've got blue eyes, I don't, obviously doesn't really affect your health too much. It's just one gene out of 20,000. So, so quit this. Oh, these dogs aren't purebred dogs. Or, or the other one that I hear is, that's a travesty, that should never, nobody should be doing that. Look, how do you think we got French Bulldogs in the first place? It wasn't like God came down and made French Bulldogs. That wasn't the way that it happened, folks. The way it happened is that somebody a long time ago had like an English Bulldog, and they said, you know what, I'd like to have a really small version of an English Bulldog. And so they then bred that back to some other dog. And I don't know what it was, but I'm sure if you Wikipedia you'd find out. But whatever that dog was, they produced some small little bulldogs that kind of looked like a bulldog and kind of looked like the other dog. And then they started taking some of the offspring from them and they bred them together and they got what is now today an English bulldog. Excuse me, a French bulldog. And it's a purebred dog. AKC is not going to argue about this. It's, but somewhere in the past, somebody mixed something up with something else. But don't get yourself fooled where you think that French bulldogs have been here forever. They have not. These all started from other dogs. Every single dog, Labradors, all the purebred dogs had to have come from some common ancestor. And that was not a Labrador. So quit this. Blue dogs are the absolute end of the world. You should not be doing it. Um, I, look, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. And I don't, if you don't like blue dogs, I don't have a problem with that. But just get your facts right in terms of what you think is really going on here. So now I want to talk about something rather different here, and that is genetic diversity, because this one really does matter. And this is, where, this is where people should be harping on it, and they're not. So, <clears throat> I want to make a lineage here of a typical 
pedigree. So we've got we've got grandparents. I'm just going to label them as numbers for the for the for the hell of it. <clears throat> and I probably need to move that down because I bet you that you can't see that on the video. So let's come down. Here we go. So here we've got eight. Better get my number in right. Eight parents. One, two. <laughs> This is why you should practice this stuff before you start putting on a board. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Here's our eight, right? Eight grandparents. And they had offspring. <clears throat> so those two paired together as males and females, males and females. And they produced this next line. And those then got together and they produced the direct parents of the final puppy that we're talking about. Here he is, or she is. Here's the final puppy. So that puppy there had two parents, <clears throat> uh, two parents are here, four grandparents, and eight, grand eight great, great grandparents. So the genetic, genetic diversity of this dog comes from eight other dogs. That's its genetic diversity. Now, Typically, to, if you start off with a couple of different dogs and you put them together, after about 10 rounds of this, you would end up with a dog that was unique and had real, you know, it had all the qualities that you want, whatever that is. So if you look, that, that number of breedings, by the way, is two to the 10th. That's how many puppies are standing behind it. A puppy that has 10 generations behind it has two to the 10th parents. Let's just work out what that number is real quick. That number is two parents, four grandparents, Eight grandparents, great grandparents, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1,024 dogs in 10 generations is providing the genetic material for that single puppy. It's got a huge diversity, and that doesn't even describe the, 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 the dog population. I mean, there's obviously a ton more of them up there. But the point here is, is very quickly, you get a huge amount of genetic diversity from all these, all of these guys. So that's, that's how we want it. That's great. Everything's good. You get a blue dog in there, doesn't matter. It's not going to be a problem. It's not going to be deaf. It's not going to be stupid. It's not going to have wonky legs. I mean, you can have those for other reasons, but it's not because it's a blue dog. That's for damn sure. Now, now here's where the problem is. So somebody wants to introduce a new line of French Bulldogs, Fluffies. So they produced, <clears throat> they had two parents, and they produced a dog, and that dog was a Fluffy. And they're like, hey, that's kind of cool. I want more of that stuff. So they had two offspring in that litter. Here's Fluffy female. Here's Fluffy female, <clears throat> and here's Fluffy male. So what do they do? They breed those together. And they produce another fluffy and there he is there's another fluffy right there right so why would you do that well people in the showroom absolutely do this all the time it's called line breeding and inbreeding and the reason you do it is you're trying to strengthen a particular quality in this case it was the fluffy gene we're trying to get done the problem gets to be that this dog has very little genetic diversity it just doesn't have a lot of dogs standing behind it so if this dog here has the dreaded gene, whatever it might be, we'll put a little skull and crossbones over here. If that dog has that skull and crossbone gene that we don't want, and this one had it as well, I don't have my skull and crossbones, there they are right there. This one had it as well, they each had one copy of it. Neither of them had a problem, we didn't know it was there, it was fine, until they got together here. This poor dog here, then he gets, or she gets, two copies of the deadly gene we're talking about, whatever it might be, deafness, sickle cell anemia, Hunter's disease, or whatever, this dog gets it. And it gets in a double dosage and it exhibits it. And that is the problem. So the problem is not that the blue gene's bad or the chocolate gene's bad. The problem is the genetic diversity when you're starting out on new kinds of dogs, the genetic diversity is not very great. And you can run into this bad situation that you hardly ever run into in a regular population, but you will very likely run into problems if you start mucking around with this line breeding situation. So here's an interesting part to this. If you think about this, you, know, you think, 
Okay, well dogs, no, certain animals are becoming extinct, right? Okay, so it's really easy. Look, just take two of them, male and the female, stick them in the zoo, look after them, and then we'll start a, we'll just replenish the, the planet with these, you know, new double-legged Hitsawimas, right? The problem gets to be is the genetic diversity again. You've got these two dogs that you're starting off with, and you breed to produce a dog, and then you breed again to produce another dog from them, and you then breed them together, and you have no genetic diversity. And so what happens is something happens that wipes out all the offspring. That's why genetic diversity matters. I'll give you a good example of this would be the kings and queens of Europe. They all intermarried because they had to keep their royal bloodlines clean, but they had hemophilia in there, and so lots of the kings and queens of England had haemophilia and they died over it. They'd get cut, they'd bleed like crazy, and it would never stop bleeding and they'd die. So that was an example of why inbreeding can cause all kinds of problems. I'll give you another one to do with potatoes. In Ireland, um, they had only one strain of potatoes and they kept on using these strains to make more and more potatoes. It was a staple diet in Ireland back in the, I don't know what it was, 1700s, 1800s. Then they had some insect, the potato blight, and it wiped out the entire crop. There was no genetic diversity because it all came from one potato in the first place, or probably two. There was no genetic diversity, and it wiped out the entire crop, and lots of people on Ireland died of hunger because they didn't have any potatoes to eat. So I think that's all I want to say on this, but the, the, the point here is, is do worry about genetic diversity. That does matter. If you've got a new line of whatever, and there are not a lot of those dogs in that line. You can expect there to be problems. But when you start looking at things like um, blue dogs, chocolate dogs, blue and tan dogs, in, for instance, the Frenchy world that I know about, there is a huge genetic diversity. And to think that a single gene that is going to cause all kinds of hell is just ludicrous. So that was it. If you, uh, if you like what I say, give me a thumbs up. If you think I'm mad, let me know and uh, appreciate you watching or love it if you subscribe to me. And uh, remember, love your dogs because that's all that really matters. Bye, everybody.